I have stayed here uh, because it allows me to do several different things that I really enjoy doing. Um, it allows me to continue to teach um, at the undergraduate level and now moving into the graduate level. It allows me to continue doing um, some clinical athletic training, clinical sports medicine. Um, our certified athletic trainers take care of the athletes here, so they're out on the fields and they um, you know, evaluate sports injuries, they do rehab. Um, so I'm the medical director, so I work between our athletic trainers and our um, physicians and I run our weekly clinic so it allows me still to be in the athletic training room and working with injured athletes and getting them better and getting them scheduled for surgeries and those types of things. And then it also allows me to do the research that I'm passionate about. Um, I study primarily football players and ice hockey players as my population because I study uh, heat illness and thermoregulation in athletes. My specific niche population has been uh, those athletes that are uh, uh, in a position um, in their sport activity that causes them to sweat heavily and get very hot, um, which is, you know, large male athletes in particular. Uh, and my focus has primarily been on American football players. However, um, ice hockey players have some of the same fluid balance issues in that they tend to be uh, heavy sweaters. Um, so we do a lot of sweat analysis to actually calculate how much um, of their electrolytes they're losing and then how much they need to, to replace. Um, the other side of that is uh, determining how, how hot athletes get when they're actually practicing in the field. So um, one of the real uh, spin-offs that I've been able to do in the past uh, eight to ten years is studying these athletes actually in the field. So we have technologies now that allow us, um, for instance, if we're looking at body temperature where the athletes swallow little sensors. Um, that get into their digestive system and then I'm able to walk around the field with just a little recorder and tell how hot they are and record how hot they are. So part of the research has really grown out of the fact that the technology is such now that we can, we don't just have to study them in a laboratory situation but we can actually go out to football practice and, and study how hot they get you know, out of football practice. The sweat analysis has been interesting in that it allows us to calculate, if we look at calculating how fast someone sweats um, in, in liters per hour, and then take sweat samples from subjects, and I take those into my lab and analyze those for particularly sodium content, how much salt they're losing. And we can actually calculate how many grams of sodium an athlete might lose during the course of a practice. And it's, it's fairly eye-opening um, when you think about some of these athletes that are not only heavy sweaters, um, but their salt content is very high in, in, in sodium concentration. Um, so when you add all those up and you look at just numbers, we literally have athletes who are sweating um, at such a rate and with such high salt content that they might be losing a tablespoon of salt an hour, for instance, which is incredibly high when you think about athletes practicing for four hours a day and how much salt that actually might be. Um, so, it, you know, the, the, the problem comes in with a, with, a team, with a sport like football where they're practicing on consecutive days of how do we put that sodium back on consecutive days when they're out there in July and August and it's very hot and they're all wrapped in equipment, um, you know, and they, they become sodium depleted, we call it. And really, and you've looked in the literature, um, so far they're the only athletes um, where we've published data with that extent of that kind of sodium loss. We've gotten to the point in the professional athletes of individually replacing their salt losses. So in consecutive years of doing sweat analysis, you know, if I have 10 or 12 um, football players, I know each individual player's needs. So one player might need a very small amount of, of sodium replacement, or maybe none at all. And another player might need 10 times that amount. Another player might you know, need 20 times that amount. So it's, it's quite variable. The other part of studying this thermoregulation and fluid balance is actually looking not only at how hot players get, and we've been quite surprised over the years of doing that field research to see how hot they actually get, and, and, and many times they're absolutely asymptomatic. They don't have any symptoms related to their, their high core temperatures, but many of them are out there, and, and it's, you know, their body temperature is 103 or maybe 104, sometimes higher. Um, that's how hot they are, and we used to think in the sports medicine um, field that they were having heat stroke when they got that hot, when in fact many athletes are that hot and they have no signs and symptoms of heat stroke. The other part of this research is, is studying and trying to figure out why certain players get hot. 
um, and if they get hot, how fast can we bring them down to normal body temperature. We have a very old but still functioning environmental chamber down in Sturzbecker. We can get it very hot, so it's, a, it's basically a uh, enclosed uh, metal enclosed room um, that's big enough for two subjects and probably another two, maybe three researchers to get into. We make them very hot and then we submerge them in um, very cold water and then we see how fast the cooling rate is um, with the idea that it's likely going to take longer for a very large person with a higher percent body fat to get cool than it will for a, 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 a runner. So then we have some idea if you're not continuously monitoring core temperature that um, you might be able to cool a small um, aerobically trained runner that's very lean, you might be able to cool them down in a matter of, of 10 or 12 minutes, whereas a very large athlete, it might take considerably longer than that, which is a very helpful thing for a, for a clinician who's out there practicing to know. You know. I need to leave my offensive lineman you know, in that cold tub for 20 or 25 minutes to bring them down to you know, what we consider a, an okay tor core temperature, which is, which is about 101.5, so that they're gonna come down at that rate.